The events of the film take place in the midst of the Second World War. A U.S. Air Force team is on a reconnaissance mission over the waters of the Pacific Ocean. The crew of the American torpedo bomber consists of Commander Harold Dixon, radio operator Gene Aldrich and bombardier Tony Pastel. The team has become too distant from the other aircraft on the mission and is now unable to orient themselves in space. Captain Harold decides to return to the aircraft carrier, but the crew fails to locate the warship at the given coordinates. Breaking the radio silence, Gene tries to contact the base, but gets on the radio wave of the Japanese and interrupts the broadcast. The fuel level in the aircraft is dropping rapidly. To lighten the plane, Tony drops the bomb into the water. After a lengthy search for the aircraft carrier, the captain decides to land the plane on the water and orders the crew to pack the essentials and prepare a lifeboat. After a successful landing, the captain is the first to get out. The bomber gradually begins to sink and the remaining crew members, panicking, cannot unfasten their belts. Already underwater, the guys manage to get out and they are reunited with the captain. The trio inflate the lifeboat, but it turns upside down. When trying to turn over the rubber boat, the team loses the only flashlight. Already in the boat, the guys had a chance to get to know each other better. Confident that they will be rescued the very next day, the trio fall asleep. The first day of the team in the open ocean begins. Not realizing the danger of the situation, the guys feel relaxed and have an impromptu tea party. The commander tells the crew that they need to distribute observation zones and look in all directions so as not to miss the rescue aircraft. After some time, the crew really notices a high-speed aircraft in the sky, but they have nothing to signal. Due to the panic during the landing, the guys forgot to pick up the signal lights and parachutes. The trio frantically wave their clothes in an attempt to get their attention, but the plane doesn't notice them and flies away. Harold tells the crew that this was their only chance for survival. Their team landed in the territorial waters of the enemy and, taking wartime into account, their command will not risk going on a second search. The trio were left without food, water and communication in the middle of the largest ocean in the world. Emotionally, the commander blames Gene for everything, due to the fact that he was unable to catch the aircraft carrier's signal. Realizing the danger of the situation, Harold takes command of the lifeboat and tells the guys to obey him unquestioningly. As his first order, he tells the guys to empty out all their pockets to see what they have to survive. They have at their disposal, a pistol with two magazines of cartridges, a pocket knife, pliers, a coil of wire, a cable, an empty bag for water and accessories that will help you navigate the terrain. Harold then orders the guys to throw out their shoes so they don't rub on the boat. He keeps his pair of boots with him so that he will have something to wear when they get to land. Gene and Tony spend the rest of the day talking about food and military service while their captain naps off to the side. Later, Harold tells the team to take turns on duty all night and keep an eye on the situation. Replacing Gene, the captain decides to urinate. Since urine is their only source of drinking water, the man fills his shoe with it and drinks from it. The second day is coming. Harold calculates the boat's approximate position and informs the crew that the nearest landmass is thousands of miles away. So far, their boat is heading towards the Hawaiian Islands, but if they are lucky with a fair wind, they will reach a small cluster of friendly islands much earlier. Gene suggests that the crew try fishing for food. From improvised means, the guys build a homemade fishing rod and launch it into the water. Within a few moments, the prey is hooked. Overjoyed, the team tries to drag the catch into the boat, but the caught fish turns out to be hungrier than the trio, and eats half of the rope along with the hook. The crew spends several more hours under the scorching sun. Tony is inspired to think about how he will be awarded the medal after everything is over. Harold suggests that their team could be sued for sending a bomber to the bottom of the ocean. Tony says that no one is to blame for the crash landing, to which Gene replies that there is still a culprit and throws an unambiguous look at the commander. Tired of fishing without a catch, Gene decides to swim. Harold warns the crew that it's best to stay close to the boat because there may be sharks in the water. Hearing this, Gene immediately comes back, and Tony changes his mind about going for a swim next. Thus ends another day. On the third day, Gene and Tony again remember what brought them to the service and what they did before the war. Tony reveals that he graduated with honors from the mechanics course. Upon hearing this, the commander starts blaming the bombardier for the crash landing due to his inexperience as a navigator. With each passing day the morale of the team is deteriorating. Tony is so thirsty that he is ready to drink water from the ocean, but the commander stops him in time. Five days pass under the scorching sun, and the crew wonders why they haven't already died without water and food. Harold says that what saves them is that they don't move much and drink their own water. Feeling his pockets, the commander is surprised to find a pencil and from memory draws a map of the perimeter in which they are located. After calculating the approximate coordinates, Harold informs the team that they are moving in the right direction, which greatly encourages the guys. The trio builds an anchor out of things, so as not to go astray in case of the wrong wind direction. Now the crew can only hope for a fair wind and rain so that they can quench their thirst. 
they decide to pray to ask the higher powers to give them water from the sky. To support each other, the guys begin to sing a song with which they see off another exhausting day. In the end, their prayers were heard and at night it starts to rain. Happy guys collect water in a bag and clothes, and finally get to drink their fill. This extends their life by a few more days. Under the hot sun, the trio's skin is covered with burns and blisters. Gene does not stop trying to catch fish, but he's unsuccessful. The guy loses his patience and pulls out a knife to impale at least some kind of catch on it. The commander orders Gene to hide the knife so as not to damage the boat, but he does not listen to the commander and starts stabbing the water with the knife. Soon the guy manages to cling to something, and Harold thinks that the guy still pierced the boat. But, to everyone's surprise, Gene plunges a knife into the shark, which is immediately intercepted by Tony. Together, the team takes care of the predator and rewards themselves with a hearty meal. There is so much shark meat that the guys save some of the prey for later. Tony tells the team that he has a sister and Jean asks to describe her for him. Hearing a friend's story about a beautiful girl, Jean falls in love with her image. After killing the predator, the boat is filled with its blood. Without thinking, the guys squeeze the blood into the water, which attracts even more sharks. The team realizes that they are surrounded by dangerous predators and now their chances of survival have been greatly reduced. At night, waking up after a bad dream, Jean decides to wash himself, completely forgetting about the bloodthirsty inhabitants of the ocean. As soon as the guy puts his hands in the water, the predators immediately pounce on him and leave deep teeth marks on his arm. Surviving the shock of what he saw, Tony asks the commander what their crew will be called on land. To which Harold replies that they will be called lost at sea, and that will end all concern about their future fate. The following days are hard for the crew of the boat. They run out of water, they cannot get food and all that remains for them is to pray and wait for God's help again. It's day 15 at sea, and Tony looks at his gun with a strange look. Jean notices this and takes the weapon from his comrade, but not so that he does not shoot himself. A Kaplan sits next to the sleeping commander and Jean shoots the bird. A loud shot next to his ear wakes Harold up, but quickly orienting himself, dives into the water after the dead bird. Having miraculously avoided the fate of being eaten by a huge shark, the commander manages to return to the boat with prey. The men eat it without pleasure, comparing its taste with raw chicken. Five more days have passed since then. The trio is completely tired and exhausted by the daily struggle for survival. The next morning, the captain wakes up and finds that his subordinates are sleeping and no one is monitoring the situation. In a rage, he begins to chastise the crew, to which Tony tells him not to order them out, but to be on the lookout himself. The guys ask the commander when they finally get to the islands he spoke about. So it turns out that Harold made a map based only on his guesses and that they should have reached the friendly islands four days ago. This becomes the last straw for Jean. He reminds the commander how he forced them to throw away their boots, how he blamed them for the forced landing of the plane, and how he constantly gave orders, while leading his team to nowhere. Suddenly, Harold remembers what really happened inside the bomber. During the mission, he dozed off at the helm for a couple of minutes, and because of this he flew past the place where the aircraft carrier was located. Realizing that it was because of his mistake that the team was lost, he apologizes to his subordinates with pain in his voice. For a while, the trio spends in silence, immersed in bleak thoughts. Jean is the first to break the silence and decides to support the commander. He suggests using Harold's map anyway to find a way to land. This restores the man's self-confidence, and he cuts his shoes to make oars out of them. The exhilarated crew paddle forward, fantasizing about what they will do once they see land again. It's been a month since the plane crashed. The trio is thirsty again and begins to lose their last hope of salvation. In the evening, clouds are gathering in the sky and the guys understand that soon they will be able to drink water. But a new test awaits them, the rain turns into a terrible storm. The boat is covered with waves and the commander is thrown overboard. He manages to get back, but the next huge wave covers the boat completely and the whole trio is in the water. From the overturned boat, all the things that helped the team survive all these days go under the water. But despite everything, the guys manage to climb back into the boat and survive the storm. In the morning, the guys begin to jokingly talk about how they will butcher each other's bodies without a knife when one of them dies. The commander says that if they survive, he will give the guys recommendations, if he is ever heard at the military court. To which the subordinates say that they have no idea what they can judge Harold for, letting him know that they will not betray their commander. From these words, the man begins to cry. After some time, the commander notices that Tony lies with his eyes open and does not move. The guys decide that their comrade is dead, but after a moment his eyes blink and he comes to his senses. Suddenly, Jean notices islands in the distance and reports what he saw to the others. Overjoyed, the trio use their remaining strength to row to land, but the wind already carries them in the right direction. Waves throw them ashore, and they lie down on the long-awaited land. The commander notices small structures ahead, and realizes that they are now safe. Rising, 
the trio casts a farewell glance at the lifeboat and, leaning on each other, they go forward to the houses. And so, the bomber crew spent 34 days in the Pacific and traveled over a thousand miles in a small lifeboat. After all the events, Harold received a reward for leading his team to safety. Because of the experience, Tony gave up his military career. Gene served until the end of World War II as a radio operator and married Tony's sister.